Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Esther. We've taken a few weeks break with our celebration service and others planned, but today we pick up the story uh, right where we left off in Esther chapter 6. As you're locating that, I'll mention I was, while we were away, I was thinking about um, the book of Esther, and I was actually reading a magazine, and it sparked a thought, and I thought, if I was to ever preach the book of Esther again, uh, I would probably entitle the series Providence Illustrated. Because that's exactly what the book, that's what we've been learning in the book of Esther, that God works behind the scene. That in his providence and in his sovereignty, uh, he is guiding and leading the, the, the God who declares the end from the beginning is causing all things to work according to to his good pleasure. And so we see that once again today in Esther chapter 6. How many of you would say, and I'd like to see a show of hands, how many of you would say that you just came off of a busy week? Raise your hand. Okay? Hands down. How many of you would say that you're just about to go into a busy week. Raise your hands. Now, a lot of you raised your hands twice, all right? So, shame on you. Uh, spend today as a day of rest, all right? If you're going from busy week to busy week. You know, some of us, if we were honest, we probably can't remember a time when we weren't busy. For most Americans today, busyness seems to be par for the course. And it's not just for those in the sort of prime of life, raising kids, 20s, 30s, 40s. I, I've talked to many of you that are retirees, and you say, I am busier now. I'm doing more now in my retirement years than I did before. Jane Austen once said that life seems but a quick succession of busy nothing. You ever feel that way sometimes? That life is nothing more, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's just this rapid-fire succession of busy nothings. In between phone calls and emails, paying bills, having meetings, running errands, changing diapers, doing chores, the, all the sort of little tasks of life, things that have to get done, but sometimes they seem to eat up all of our time and to make us incredibly busy. Because of this, some of us were looking for the next, constantly longing for the next season in life. S some of you are high school students saying, I just can't wait till I get to college. And some of you in college are saying, I just can't wait to get into my career. And some of you in your careers, you know, you're thinking, I just can't wait to get that promotion. Or, or maybe you're in that career and you're, you're a wife or mother thinking, I wish I could just, I can't wait till I can be a stay-at-home mom. And, and the stay-at-home moms are thinking, I just wish I could get a nap. You know, I mean, that's... <laughs> they work harder than the rest of us, right? Uh, they, they certainly do. But sometimes we're so busy in each season of life, in each days of life, that we almost, we feel trapped, don't we? Trapped by our calendar. It's sort of that constant taskmaster, constantly looking at our phones and looking at our calendars and figure out, what have I got to do next? And we become very utilitarian. Just, I just got to check things off the box and, 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 and functionally go through things. And if we're not careful, this can impact our spiritual life. Busyness becomes an excuse that I, I, I know I could spend more time with God if I just had a different schedule. I could love God more. I could serve God more. I know I could, I could see God working more of my life. I just wasn't, if I wasn't so busy, if I just didn't have all these busy nothings. Well, the chapter before us this morning in Esther chapter 6 is this, this quick succession of seemingly busy nothings. 
In this chapter, it's all of these, the the kind of to-do list, calendar appointment things that all of us do, things that just sort of fill time. And yet, what we learn in Esther chapter 6, listen to me, is that these these busy nothings, when, when put together, they're not just random and coincidental, when put together, these busy nothings stand as a, as a monument to the providence of God. That the things that eat up your schedule, that take up your time, you're saying, man, I just wish, God, I wish I could have a different schedule so that I could, could, could see you working. And God through Esther chapter 6 is saying, no, 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 hold on, wait a minute. Why don't you take the schedule that you have and see how I'm currently working? Esther chapter 6 stands as this wonderful illustration that yes, God's t- or excuse me, our timing is not always God's timing, but God's timing is always best. Our timing is not always God's timing, but God's timing is always best. And it's through the busy nothings, it's through the appointments and calendars and schedules, through these just sort of mundane things in life that the invisible hand of God is no doubt at work. How does God do this? Well, let's see it in the story of Esther. There's two scenes in chapter 6. And these two scenes will, will teach us basically two truths about God working behind the scene. Now, I I want to warn you up front, or not warn you, but tell you up front. As we read this chapter, there's a couple things that are supposed to happen as you read it. Every reader is supposed to respond in a couple of ways. Okay, number one, as you read chapter 6, you you should respond to this chapter uh, at the very least by seeing the irony of it, and, and at the most, you should find this chapter hilarious. If you've been reading it this week, this chapter is just filled with... It's, it borders on comedy of how the events unfold and how the conversations happen. So don't feel bad if you find yourself chuckling at what happens because it's intended to be that way. But at the same time, as you find the, the, the irony or the comedy of this chapter, you should also sit back and say, Wow. Only God could take a random this, a random that, a random this, a random that, and put it together for His glory. So there's two truths from two scenes. The first truth, well, I've actually mentioned it in previous weeks, but I want to say it again. Truth number one from verses 1 through 9 is that what men call coincidence, God calls providence. What men call coincidence... God calls providence. Now let's see how this unfolds in chapter 6, verse 1. During that night, we have to pause there already. During what night? Well, it's been a few weeks, so if you'll listen quickly, let me get everybody caught up. Some of you are visiting, you've not heard what's been happening, let's hear it. We're in the year 600 B.C. 600 years before Jesus, the Persian Empire is the the giant political bullies of the day. And the king of Persia is a man named Ahasuerus, also called Xerxes. Ahasuerus has a right-hand man named Haman. He has a beautiful, gorgeous wife named Esther. Esther has an uncle named Mordecai. Mordecai and Haman do not get along, okay? That's an understatement. All right, they, Haman hates Mordecai's guts. In fact, he wants to see him killed. Think of Haman, if you will, as sort of the beta version of Adolf Hitler. Because he wanted not just to kill Mordecai, but his plan was to annihilate all the Jews. He planned a genocide, a holocaust. With the king's permission and, and government backing, there was a day set aside to kill all the Jews. So in this process, Mordecai finds out about the plan. He goes to Esther, the wife of the king, and says, you need to go talk to your husband, and you need to to plead for your people. 
And so she goes to her husband, remember in chapter 5, and she, she asked the king and Haman to a banquet, and he says, what is your request, Esther? And she says, my request? Well, how about you come back tomorrow for another banquet, and then I will answer your question. So they leave in part ways. Esther goes off to plan tomorrow's banquet. The king goes home to go to bed. Haman goes home, and he tells his wife and his friends about this Mordecai who we encountered on the way home, and he says, I hate that guy. I want him dead now. I don't want to wait to that day. I want him dead now. So they said, well, why don't you just do it? Have, have, go hire some guys and write a blueprint up and build a gallows, and when you have the gallows built, then go to the king and ask the king if you can go ahead and just kill Mordecai. And Haman thought, yes, I like that plan. So the king goes to bed, Esther goes home to make plans for tomorrow's banquet, and Haman goes home, and his construction team starts building the gallows. Everybody up to speed now? Okay. During that night, verse 1. During that night, the king could not sleep. Go figure. You think he's got a few things on his plate? Why can't he sleep? Well, the text doesn't tell us. For one, he may be sitting there lying in bed, and it's, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he's thinking to himself, why do I hear the scraping of saws and the banging of hammers right outside my... Who is working in the middle of the night? What are they building outside, you know? Or he may have been laying in bed thinking, worried about Esther's request. You remember he offered her up to half of his kingdom. Maybe she's going to take him up on it. (laughs) We don't know exactly, but he he can not sleep. And by the way, there's an old proverb that says, Big doors swing on little hinges. This whole story is about to change because of this little hinge, this one sleepless night some of you by the way right now you're in situations that just seem hopeless seem helpless you think you're never going to get out of it things are never going to change listen to me don't give up hope don't give up your faith because god can work a miracle overnight and that's what he does in one night one sleepless night The whole fate of Israel and the whole fate of Esther and the whole story changes. It says, during that night, the king could not sleep. Why? So what? So he gave an order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. My kids got excited when we read that because they thought it was the chronicles of Narnia. Um, (laughs) Like it was a bedtime story of sorts. Well, really, it it was kind of a, a, a bedtime story of sorts. When they read the, the, the records, the chronicles, what, what they did was, in those days, uh, a man would follow the king around everywhere, and he would journal everything down. Today, for instance, in the White House, there's a, there's a paid full-time photographer. And every year, he and his staff take over a million pictures of the president. And they can't delete any of them. They all go into the National Archives. No matter how exciting or boring the pictures may be, they all have to be preserved. Well, in those days, the the journal, the record of the king was like that. Here's what you had for lunch. Here's who you met with. Here's what you discussed. You took a nap. I mean, like, it's just all the things that he did on a day-to-day basis. So he he brings these things, and he says, please read the Chronicles to me. Now, why does he do this? Well, this this is the ancient version of today what we call Ambien, right? This is, this is a sleep aid, all right? He... He is literally trying to go back to sleep. That's, you don't read this for new information. You read this just to go to bed. He's trying to, to, to lull himself back into sleep. And so here he is sleepless in, in Susa. And he's trying to decide what he's going to do as this man is reading. Now, by the way, look at verse uh, 2. It was found written what Mordecai had reported concerning Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Now, those of you who have been with us, do you remember that story? That was back in chapter 2. That was that random story 
that the author threw in there. That Mordecai heard about this plot to kill the, the, the king, and so he told Esther, and Esther told them, and they, they, they foiled it all. So now that story comes back into play. Now what happened years ago is, is significant. Now, by the way, let me point something else out that's, that's showing you how God works through our schedules and our times and our routines. The king says, go get a journal and read it to me. I just want to go back to sleep. King Ahasuerus has been king for 13 years. Do you know how many volumes of the journal there were? And of all the sections for them to pull off the shelf, on this one sleepless night, it just happens to be the section about Mordecai. We sometimes say that the devil is in the details, but I think here the Lord is in the details. Here they pull off this one journal entry, and that's what they read to the king, and something grabs his attention, verse 3. The king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? This guy saved my life. We've got to do something for him. Then the king's servant who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king said, Who is in the court? Again, here we find Haman, or uh, uh, Ahasuerus, he is the most indecisive king on the face of the planet. He can't make any decisions by himself. He has, he's like a, your consummate politician. What does everybody else think? You know, I mean, that's how, he, that's how he makes all of his decisions. So he's like, well, somebody else has got to help me. I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I need to honor this man. So notice what's happening here. Oh, it's just delicious. <laughs> the king is laying in his bed thinking about Mordecai. Guess who else at that exact same moment is thinking about Mordecai? Look what it says in verse 4. Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows which he had prepared for him. What are the odds? I mean, seriously. Do you see the providence of God here? The king is laying in his bed thinking, how do we honor Mordecai? And Haman is thinking, how do I murder Mordecai? They both come to this moment in this exact instant, and he enters the court right at the moment when the king needs to talk to somebody, and it says in verse 5, the king's servants then said to him, Behold, which by the way, in the Bible, oftentimes you should read the word behold and think to yourself, believe it or not. In most cases, that's what it's trying to convey. It's something unexpected that's about to be said. So he says here, Behold, believe it or not, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, Well, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, verse 6, What is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? What do you think? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? (laughs) What a narcissist. This guy is so full of himself that he uses this opportunity and, and just filled with arrogance. Well, he must be talking about me, you know. By the way, notice what it says in there. And Haman said to himself. You say, then how do we have it in the Bible? Even though Haman thought this to himself, he thought it loud enough for God to hear. You know, the Lord knows your thoughts, right? Even though you don't say it, even though you may not write it down or send it on an email or a text message, the Lord knows the secrets of the hearts of men and women. And he knows here that Haman in his pride is is, is full of himself. So verse 7, Then Haman said to the king, For the man who the king desires to honor... Let him bring a royal robe which the king has worn and the horse on which the king has ridden and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble princes and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor and lead him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. The king says... Haman, what do you think? What do you think I ought to do? And he thinks, well, I think this is for me. He's like, ah, 
oh, king, you don't have to do anything much. Just a full-blown parade. I mean, that's, you know, that's all. Just something small, you know. Get a horse and a stallion and a robe and a crown and, oh, yeah, just have this big processional through the city streets and everybody will turn and look and celebrate the person, honor the person, because clearly if you're going to honor them, they deserve to be honored. And here, Haman's own words set himself up for how the story is going to change. Now, do you see what's happening in these first nine verses? Do you see the timing of all these things? We we complain about our schedules and how busy we are and all these random things and these encounters and these conversations and all this stuff seems to get in our way all the time and we see coincidence after coincidence after coincidence after coincidence and yet all of them are happening and Fulfilled by the providence of God. By the way, the word coincidence, it's just the non-Christian's word for providence. That's the difference. We look at these, these, these happenings that just happen to happen, and we say, well, how on earth does this go about? I mean, what an what a incredible string of, of unexpected random events. No, 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 no. The point of Esther is that this is happening by the hand of God. It's sort of like... The, the, the invisible hand of God works in our world and, and governs even the choices of men and, and despite the, 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 the evil intentions of men, it's not that God causes those things, but God in His sovereignty and God in His, His power, he, he governs those things to accomplish what He intends. It's like the wind. How many of you have ever seen the wind? None of us have. But we see the effects of the wind. You see the leaves blowing and the trees bending. We, we see the, the invisible effects uh, or the effects of the invisible wind in our world. And the providence of God likewise. God's invisible hand is working in our world to accomplish that which is for His good pleasure. And so not just in the story of Esther, my friends, in, in your own life, through the decades of your life, through the years, through the months, through the weeks, through the days, down to the hours and the minutes, even the seconds, do not doubt the providence of God. Don't see your life merely as just a a string of random things that happen. Look back on them and, and learn to connect the dots of God's providence. And to appreciate what you've gone through. Maybe things you chose, maybe things you didn't choose that, that, that hurt you. Things where you were the victim in. It doesn't mean it was right and doesn't mean it was good. doesn't mean that God, if you will, wanted it to happen. The point of providence is that despite those things, God is working for your good and for His glory. Somebody asked me after the service, he said, help me sort this out. And I said, listen, Romans 8 says, it does not say, for God causes all things. It says God causes all things to work together for good. He is working in our world to bring about that which is good and right. What do we read earlier in Ecclesiastes chapter 3? There is a time for every event under heaven. Every event. The things that fill our schedules, the things that drive us crazy, all the things in our to-do list, there's a time for all of them. D. James Kennedy, some of you may remember that name, years ago, he used to tell his congregation, he says, always be on the lookout for divine appointments. You know what a divine appointment is? It's those moments like this that we don't think twice about them, and yet God may have brought a person into our path or through our lives or a circumstance or a situation that he is using for our good and for his glory. Yes, our timing is not always God's timing, but God's timing is always perfect. Remember John chapter 11? Mary and Martha? Lazarus is dead? And Jesus shows up? And Mary and Martha are upset. Why? Because Jesus showed up four days late. But my friends, he was right on time. He was right on time. And, 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 and through that, not just a string of coincidences, by the providence of God, he was glorified in that situation. Psalm 90 says, Lord, teach us to count the days. I think another way to say it is, Lord, teach us to make the days count. Redeem the time, as Paul said. 
to look back on our lives, to look back at the situations of our life, saying, yes, and God causes all things, sleepless nights, chance encounters, random meetings, interruptions, the chores, the, the schedules. God causes all those things to work together for good. To those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. Don't just see your life as coincidences. Understand and appreciate God's providence. The second truth that we see here is that by this providence, by God's providence, and in due time, men will reap what they sow. By this providence, and in due time, men will reap what they sow. So Haman responds and says, here's what you ought to do for him. And he gives this wonderful parade idea, verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, take quickly the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so for... You can just see Haman salivating on himself at this point. He's just drooling all over himself. Do so for Mordecai the Jew. Listen closely. You can hear his jaw hit the floor. What? For Mordecai, the very guy that I was coming here to get permission to kill, and now you want this guy to to be honored? And then notice what he says, Mordecai who is sitting at the king's gate, and notice this, and do not fall short in anything of all that you have said. So be sure you do it and do exactly what you prescribed. And, and, you know, you, Haman, you are the party planning committee, all right? You have planned the party, now you go do it. Take this guy, Mordecai, honor him, rejoice, celebrate, do all the things that you said. So verse 11, I'm going to read here what I think the Hebrew is saying. So Haman begrudgingly took the robe and the horse and reluctantly, that's not really in there, but he arrayed Mordecai and led him, (laughs) Haman led Mordecai on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires honor. (laughs) You can just imagine that's exactly how he did it. I mean, How strange of a reversal of fate, if you will. How the whole story is turned upside down on its head. It's it's Haman who marches Mordecai through the streets, drawing it to... Instead of being Haman, uh, instead of being Mordecai's executioner, he has to be his cheerleader. He has to be the one that draws it. Look at how great he is. Look how wonderful he is. If you don't believe God has a sense of humor... That's proof right there. He, he, he turns the rolls one back on the other. Verse 12, Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home mourning with his head covered. That's, a, that's an ancient way of, of showing shame or disgrace. He covered his head and ran home. You know, I don't want anybody to see what's going on here. Now, by the way, let me point out here what's so interesting. It says in verse 12, Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. He just goes back to work as usual. But it's interesting to see here that now these two men are beginning to reap what they've sown. Mordecai had done good, but for a long time it went unrewarded. Right? Right? If the king hadn't been sleepless and read this one moment, this this mistake, if you will, had never been corrected. By the way, if you want to see the providence of God in this, if you, you notice here, Mordecai goes so long, he does good and he goes unrewarded. And from the time he did it in chapter 2 to the time that he's now rewarded in chapter 6, it's been four years. Four years. Isn't it easy to get impatient sometimes? God, I've done what's right. I've prayed. I've read my Bible. God, I've done these things. Aren't you going to vindicate me? Aren't you going to reward me? Aren't you going to do this in good time? 
I thought, God, that you, were, you, you promised to take care of me and this, that, and the other. Listen, our timing is not always God's, but His is always perfect. What does Scripture tell us? It says in, in the New Testament, humble yourselves, listen, under the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt you in due time. It may not be your time, but it will come in due time. And here, Mordecai is finally rewarded for the good that he has done, for the righteousness, for his courage and his bravery. Finally, he reaps, if you will, what he's sown. But what's true for for Mordecai in the good is also true for Haman in the bad. Verse 13, Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him. Mordecai was royally celebrated and Haman was royally embarrassed. I mean, he's just like, can you believe what they did to me? You know, He tells them everything. Then verse 13, Then his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, Now get this, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. By the way, do you remember how this whole thing started, this whole feud? Mordecai refused to fall down before Haman. And now Haman is falling down before Mordecai. Because of his pride, because of the evil of his heart, he is now beginning to reap what he's sown. His wife, who's very wise, and his friends, who are very wise, they, they somehow link Mordecai's success to his Jewishness. Now, we don't know exactly how much they knew, but it, 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 it is clearly a faint echo, if nothing else. You remember what God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12? I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham's descendants were the Jews. And what did God say? Those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, what? I will curse. It's as if they're hearkening back. Listen, God is going to keep his promise whether the world around you wants him to or not. He's going to keep his promise through good and bad. He's going to bring those things about. By the way, one time Martin Luther was asked, give me one um, evidence, one argument for uh, the truthfulness and the reliability of the Bible. And Luther answered with two words. He said, the Jews. They should have been gone with the Philistines and the Amalekites and so many others. And yet God in His providence has spared them. And and here He says here, God is fulfilling His promise to Abraham and He's giving success here to to, to Mordecai. And Haman is now receiving his just desserts and being punished. He says, surely you will fall before Him. What did we read earlier in Ecclesiastes 3? God has appointed a day to judge the righteous and the wicked. All men will stand before him. He will judge everyone, Scripture says, according to his deeds. And, and Scripture says there that, that, that those who are righteous will be judged and rewarded, and those who are unrighteous uh, will be punished. And ultimately, we will reap what we've sown. By the way, there are some of you, you, again, you're in the midst of situations and you maybe have been hurt by others and you may be the victim of others and you're sitting back and saying, okay, God, I know you're going to vindicate me. How about we have it now? Can you just bring a little bit of it now? Well, again, his timing is not always our timing. But the, 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 the certainty of Scripture is that, listen, do not take revenge for yourself, but vengeance is mine. I will repay, declares the Lord. If there is judgment and punishment to be doled out, God will take care of it. In the meantime, we are called to to humble ourselves and to, to, to seek the good things of the Lord. As I read this, I'm reminded here of, of Philippians 2. What Mordecai does... 
He does this good deed, if you will, and then he has to wait four years before he's ever awarded, before he's ever brought uh, to, to receive his honor, before he ever receives the dignity that is due to him. He has to wait four years, and yet he continued in humility this entire time. Remember Philippians chapter 2? What does Jesus do? He has humbled himself, God becoming a man, and not just a man, but a man who died on the cross. And he didn't just die on the cross, but he then rose again from the dead, and he has ascended, and what? Yet, even though he's ascended, there is still coming a day when he will be rewarded, if you will. As Philippians 2 says, there's coming a day when Jesus will come from the clouds described in Revelation 19, and there he will be on a horse with a robe and a golden crown, and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now that day is not yet. And until that day, we pray, come Lord Jesus. And until that day, we continue in humility, knowing that He will exalt us in due time it may not be our time but it will be due time you see what esther 6 is teaching us and some of us look at our lives and we say god i need a new schedule and god is saying no 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 what you need first is a new perspective a new perspective on the schedule that you have, a new perspective on how I'm working providentially in your world, and a new appreciation for what I'm doing through the small, busy nothings of life, which will stand together as a monument for your good and for my glory. My friends, God even works through our schedules in ways that we don't always understand. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the lessons of Esther chapter 6. Father, such lessons that are so true to life. And Lord, I pray that today as we sing this final song, as we commit ourselves to you, that we would commit our schedules, that we would wake up tomorrow morning and say, Lord, I have planned my day, but I want you to determine my steps. And Father, we pray and ask that we would not just see life as filled with random happenings and coincidences. May we see and appreciate your providence in a new and personal and powerful way that you might be honored and worshipped even through our schedules, even through our busy nothings. Father, help us to commit ourselves afresh and anew to you, to your work in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.